good afternoon uh nairobi good afternoon world uh it's 4 p.m here in nairobi uh, as we start our webinar we're really very sorry we had a technical problem that's why we're about four uh, to five minutes uh, late uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, for our webinar uh, that's uh, titled innovations for investigating environmental crime uh, in kenya uh, this is the Earth Journalism Network, uh, Department of Internews, uh, where we're having this series of webinars, uh, four of them, uh, but they are uh, I mean, country-based uh, for Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and also Rwanda. It's part of our uh, Earth Journalism Network, uh, of which I think most of you who are joined here uh, and you know have acquaintance with. It's part of the, a series of webinars that we had uh, were supposed to be the routables, uh, so to speak, and they were in person uh, until Corona happened and we thought to do them uh, online. And why we're doing them a series is because we understand uh, investigative, uh, I mean, wildlife crime uh, is, is cross-border, but, but we have, you know, specific uh, problems specific to each countries. And that's why we, we, we wanted to have a series of them and this one is uh, for you Kenyan journalists uh, that are you joining us uh, this evening. Uh, as we talking, uh, we have about 29 participants. We expecting 30 uh, to 40 uh, thereabouts. Uh, these are journalists that we've worked with uh, over the years. And, and some of you have applied, if not most of you have applied for investigative uh, journalism stipends uh, that uh, the deadline came about in uh, two weeks ago. And uh, we, we thought it's good to have these investigative webinars so that even as we're judging uh, for those calls, uh, for the ones that will win those or who will be awarded, will benefit from this uh, when they're researching uh, for the stories that you pitched. But for those also who get uh, the awards, uh, we, we think and we know uh, these webinars will really be beneficial for your careers and for the work uh, that you'll be doing uh, going forward. Yeah, so for this webinar, I uh, will be uh, be here from 4 to about 5.30 p.m., uh, depending on the questions that you, you have. Uh, we have uh, four panelists that I'll be going to introduce in a few. But before that, uh, we have, you know, uh, just a few house rules that I think most of us are aware of uh, because we're spending most of our time doing webinars on Zoom and other platforms. Uh, so as you see down there, uh, there are a few icons. You'll see the Q&A icon and the chat icon. We'll urge you to ask questions to specific uh, speakers as, as they do their presentations. Uh, kindly tell us who you are, uh, which uh, media station you are with, and where you are now, and you ask your question to a particular person. And please uh, use the Q&A, don't use the chat icon. Uh, again, use the Q&A, don't use the chat uh, icon. And uh, I see we, we got a good number. As I said, we have four panelists uh, today. We are privileged to have uh, diverse uh, speakers uh, who will tell us you know, about what they do and will speak into investigating wildlife crime in East Africa and specifically in Kenya. Um, advice that we know has gone up uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll be hoping to hear these uh, from some of the speakers here. Our first speaker uh, will be James Fan, and I'll go ahead and introduce uh, them one by one now uh, before I call the first one to speak. Our first speaker will be James Fan. Uh, sorry, we'll start with Dr. Richard Thomas, uh, who works for the traffic, uh, which is the wildlife uh, that they do investigations uh, on wildlife crime uh, around the world. Uh, he's based uh, in the UK. Uh, he has worked in the conservation sector uh, for more than 20 years first at Bad Life International. And since 2007, he joined Traffic, where he's currently the head of communications. You know, the first time we have Richard Thomas uh, for our webinars, he graced uh, the first one, which really went well, and it had a lot of information uh, about, you know, uh, the nexus uh, between wildlife trade and uh, zoonotic diseases, and by large, uh, what we experience now with COVID-19. Uh, our second, uh, speaker will be James Fan, as I said, who is the global director of Internews Environmental Program and the executive director at Internews as Journalism Network, which is a global community of over 7,000 reporters 
who cover environmental topics. Uh, I believe by now uh, we have updated these members to over 10,000 uh, operating in over 100 countries. Uh, uh, James is a journalist uh, by training. Uh, he's focused on environmental, climate and science issues in developing countries. He's also a lecturer at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, where he teaches a graduate level class on international environmental reporting. Then we also have privileged to have a veteran journalist, uh, Fiona MacLeod, who is an investigative environmental journalist, and she's based in South Africa. Uh, she's pioneered the use of new tools uh, to expose equal offenses in Southern Africa and to track offenders around the world. And we'll, she'll be sharing with us tools that, that can be used even here in East Africa and that are being used. Uh, she's the founder and editor of Oxpecker's Investigative Environmental Journalism, which is Africa's first journalistic investigation unit focusing on environmental issues by combining traditional investigative reporting techniques and data analysis and also geomapping tools, which is a cool way of doing journalism work. And we excited to, to, to go through that today. And then finally, but not the least, uh, we have Dennis Okari, uh, who most of us in Kenya won't need no introduction, but I go ahead and, and, and uh, give you a brief bio. He's an award-winning investigative journalist with the Nation Media Group here in Kenya. He works for NTV as a special projects editor and news anchor. He has worked in various fields in broadcast journalism for the last 17 years for both local and international media organizations. Dennis is a certified world journalist and he'll tell us about that. He has covered news events from inside Somalia to terror attacks in the East African region. He was nominated as a 2018 goalkeeper by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as part of a new generation of young leaders accelerating progress toward the global goals. He's a writer, an art enthusiast, a media strategist, a foodie, and a villager who is still trying to find his way around the concrete jungle of Nairobi. Well, I don't think, Okari, you're a villager, but if you insist, who are we to say no? Uh, so uh, again, uh, I see we have a good number tuned in. Uh, please, uh, we'll be asking questions uh, after uh, the four panelists have uh, presented uh, their uh, uh, you know what they're going to speak about today and kindly ask questions uh, to each uh, one of them if you have a query and use the Q&A button tell us who you are who you work for and of course ask your question uh, so I will make these uh, we are recording this uh, kindly note and we'll be uploading it on our website that is the earth journalism network uh, earth journalism network dot net after this, and then we'll share again other resources plus the presentations and all the contacts. Uh, I think without further ado, I'll ask Dr. Richard Thomas of Traffic uh, to start us, to start us off. Uh, would you like to share your presentation or can I do that for you, uh, Dr. Thomas? Uh, I'll try sharing it from here, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, can uh, you see that? Yes. Good, excellent. Thank well, thank you. Good, yeah. Right, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction, Kiyundu, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and thank you to Internews for having me uh, back for a webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Thomas. I'm the head of communications at Traffic. I'm going to talk to you about perhaps some of the aspects of illegal wildlife trade uh, relevant to Kenya that perhaps. Uh, are not so much on the media radar. Okay, uh, just as a very quick um, thought, what do we mean by illegal wildlife trade? Well, it's the buying or selling trading of wild animals and plants that is in contravention of national and or international legislation. Uh, now in 2016, Traffic carried out a, an assessment of wildlife protection and trafficking uh, in Kenya. Uh, and we, this document is available on our website. The, the URL is at the bottom there. I'd encourage you, if you've got an interest in this topic, um, to download that report and it will give you a quick overview of some of the issues uh, and challenges that are, are facing uh, Kenya in particular, but uh, uh, East Africa as a whole. Um, now, just a quick thought uh, to put out there that when we talk about trade in uh, wild animals and plants, most people think, or if you talk about illegal wildlife trade, most people think about the 
iconic animals that are involved. But if you look at all the wildlife that's traded, and I'm talking legal and illegal here, uh, if you look at it as in total, actually the animals that are traded are a very small fraction, uh, something like 3% of all the trade by value and volume. Whereas the really big one uh, is forestry and timber trade is massive uh, and followed by fisheries trade, which is something like a quarter of all uh, wild animals and plants that are in trade. And then you've got your non-wood forest products, so things like your medicinal plants and fungi and so on. Uh, and even they dwarf animals, whereas uh, the focus very much in the media and interest is on those animals. And obviously they're big and iconic and everybody uh, has heard of them and there's a great deal of interest in them. But actually there's an awful lot uh, of other potential stories out there uh, that really aren't um, getting out and being spoken about. And to illustrate that, uh, here's um, a slide with some of the, the species that we know are being uh, traded uh, within Kenya. And as with any uh, trade in, in wild animals and plants, or with any trade generally, uh, while the vast majority may well be legal, there will always be an illegal element to it. Uh, now, top right, we've got the elephant ivory tusks. And I would say, uh, from my perspective as somebody who uh, deals with the media and answers journalist questions uh, on a daily basis, I would say probably 90% of the queries I receive about illegal wildlife trade are related to four animals, uh, elephants, rhinos, pangolins, and tigers. But actually, that, as, of, as the previous slide shown, that, that really is a small fraction of what's out there and being traded. So here on this slide are some other um, interesting species that are in trade uh, in Kenya, indeed uh, throughout East Africa, which have got their own interesting stories behind them. So in the middle row there on the, the left hand side, we've got fish maw, uh, or that's fish swim bladders that uh, are used medicinally. Um, we've got marine turtles. Now all marine turtles are protected under CITES and uh, most countries have also, also protect them under their national legislation, and yet we've, we've got reports of marine turtles being uh, traded and consumed uh, within Kenya. And on the right is uh, African sandalwood. Now, uh, we understand there is a very significant uh, issue in Kenya with over-harvesting of African sandalwood, uh, and it's largely being um, traded to uh, the Middle East and India. Now, I've not, uh, I've, I've never been to Kenya, <laughs> I'll, I'll be open about that, but I have been to uh, India where a lot of the African sandalwood is now headed. Uh, and in India, um, you, can, you can see areas where all the sandalwood trees are completely surrounded by barbed wire to protect them from poaching. Um, and that's, again, that's a, you know, it's an issue that, that clearly with those trees not being available in India, they're being sourced elsewhere. And Kenya is one of those sources. There's an interesting story there, uh, but you don't read about it much in the, in the media. Uh, bottom left, we've got uh, cyclid uh, fish, an example of a cyclid fish. And these are, uh, you know, uh, sourced in uh, East Africa, uh, places like Nate Navasha, and they're entering the marine aquarium trade. Uh, how well regulated is that trade? How well is it known about? And then the bottom two species, um, a seahorse you'll probably recognize, but the things on the right are, are actually sea cucumbers. Uh, and they're used particularly um, within the East Asian expat community that uh, lives and works in uh, uh, East Africa uh, and Kenya in particular. And all seahorses are protected uh, within CITES, so any cross-border trade would, uh, without permits would, would be illegal. Uh, and similarly, some of the sea cucumbers are also protected under that convention. Uh, and there's lots of other species that we know are uh, in trade uh, coming from uh, Kenya and exported to other parts of the world, species like um, pit vipers and, and uh, so on uh, that are in the um, pet trade. Lots of interesting stories. Now, the other real aspect that I don't think gets 
as much uh, attention as it really deserves is the human angle to uh, legal wildlife trade. Now, uh, a few weeks ago now, we, we published the report on the right here, the people beyond the poaching. Uh, and this was um, it's carried out by, by my colleagues in South Africa who visited the, the jails uh, in South Africa and spoke to the people who'd actually been uh, imprisoned for carrying out wildlife crime to un really understand what the motivations behind it were, how they got involved uh, and how they ended up uh, being imprisoned. And th they're just heart-wrenching, some of these stories. I mean, um, you know, a lot of the people in there, they were out of work, they just wanted to get some money to, to help feed their families. And yet they ended up uh, in jail. And they, these are real human, you know, real, really heart, uh, uh, pulling at the heartstrings, some of these stories, um, and well worth listening to. And on the, the left here is a, another study that we produced that uh, actually relates to, to Madagascar and the rosewood and ebony trade there. And it tells the tale of how uh, illegal um, rosewood loggers just entered into national parks, but the impact they had on the local communities. You, you have increases in, in prostitution, in alcoholism, things like even school truancy. Uh, you have all these sort of impacts and it really brings it home, just what the, the criminalization of society uh, means in reality uh, for areas that are impacted by uh, illegal wildlife activities like this. And of course, a lot of the uh, crime that's going on is, is organized crime. And thinking of the, the previous slide, of, of, of the people we spoke to in jail, very, very few of them were um, high up in the criminal rank. Well, none of them were high up in the criminal rank. They were basically the people who were carrying out the poaching or they were driving the contraband. They weren't the people who were actually organizing it. And that's where, um, if you really want to uh, stop and address and counter wildlife crime, you really need to bring down the top people, the, those who are really organizing it and bring it about. And one of the issues there, of course, is uh, corruption. It's a very tricky issue to, to write about and research, but it undoubtedly facilitates wildlife crime. Uh, associated with it are things like money laundering uh, and certainly traffic is doing a lot of work with financial institutions uh, because that's one way to bring down criminal activity but there's a lot of stories about that you know how do you launder money it's uh, that there's a whole sophisticated uh, techniques that some of the uh, the criminals use you know they employ lawyers and accountants and things it's it's quite remarkable so there's a lot of interesting uh, information to, to research to be looked into there. And then uh, finally, there's the logistics side of it. How do you move contraband? You know, what are the, what are the private sector companies, the shipping companies and the airlines doing uh, to try and stop their services being abused by uh, criminals? You know, uh, there's the stories from the guys who are uh, your airline check-in staff, you know, what, what do they look for? How have they, man, you know, caught people who are, uh, trafficking uh, wildlife products. On the left there is a, a, a sniffer dog and we've, we've carried out um, trials in, in Kenya at seaports using trained sniffer dogs to try and detect uh, whether uh, container cargo, shipping container cargoes contain contraband. And obviously it's, it's impractical to open up uh, large numbers of container uh, to, to check them individually. But if you basically suck the air out of a container through a cotton wool pad and put it in front of a trained dog, it will give a response if it finds something that it believes uh, shouldn't be there. So there's interesting stories like that as well to be told uh, or within this sphere. Um, I would say that all the reports that I've mentioned just now uh, and all traffic's reports are available as open access uh, on our website. So if you, you've got an interest in a particular topic, do stop by there and have a look. It's www.traffic.org. Uh, and that's um, what I'd like to say to you today. Um, obviously, I'm around for, for questions and everything. There's my contact details. If, if there's anything you, you'd like to know, 
haven't been covered uh, today, do feel free to drop me a line. Uh, and I look forward to, to hearing uh, from the other presenters. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas. As always, a very insightful um, presentation. You know, that's uh, pointing us to uh, stories. And I like, uh, I think, one of your first slides where you're talking about co commodity types. And indeed, uh, when you're talking about illegal wildlife trade, uh, we look, you know, at the, you know, big animals, you know, like um, uh, the elephants, you know, the you know, rhinos, but it's interesting to see animals, you're saying it's just 3% uh, and, 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 why, and, and the reasons why. Uh, so I don't think we've done a lot of stories on forestry and fisheries and also non-wood uh, forest products. And, and I think uh, it's important uh, for participants to note that. And uh, yes, uh, also thank you so much for pointing us to those stories uh, in seaports you know, and our uh, airports where we know, you know, illegal wildlife trade, uh, those, those are the routes. And in, in these investigative series, we really trying to, uh, to, uh, to show our, you know, reporters uh, how to investigate these stories and also where to, you know, to follow the story or follow, you know, uh, the money, so to speak. Uh, I'm still urging you to ask you questions on uh, Q&A. Uh, ask your questions to Dr. Richard. He'll be here with us until the end. And uh, uh, so we now ready for our second speaker, uh, Fiona. I don't know if you're ready. Would like to go with you a uh, second, if you don't mind. Can you see and hear me? Uh, yes, loud and clear. Very good. Hi, everyone. Yeah. And um, Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar today. Um, I hope we can share some insights into what Oxpeckers does in order to investigate wildlife and, and environmental crime. Uh, we're based in South Africa. I'd like to share my screen with you now. Hold on a sec and talk you through some points. Oopsie, there we go. Sorry, it's so hot here where we are that I think my computer's having a bit of a nervous breakdown. <laughs> so just Bear with me while I uh, get my presenter's view here. It's loading. Um, Oxpeckers investigates a lot of different topics, um, but what we have been con concentrating on in the past couple of years, we've gone back to looking at mostly wild, wildlife crime, uh, some other environmental crimes, such as the ones that Richard Thomas mentioned earlier. Um, there's a lot to do. So what I'm going to talk about today is some of the innovative, innovative techniques that we found are working for us in investigating wildlife trafficking and telling some of the conservation stories. Let me, let me get to the next, I'm not sure why we're not moving on. Okay, why, why are we looking at uh, illegal wildlife trade or wildlife crime at the moment? It's because it seems to be a growing topic, um, despite the fact that COVID-19 has been linked to Pangolin trade, illegal wildlife uh, pangolin trade. We've got um, also, we've had a couple of other pandemics uh, in the recent past that have been linked to zoonotic diseases, um, such as bird flu and the SARS COVID um, pandemic. which was linked to trade in civets. 
Now, whether that correct point is that improved technology and the increased internet access of people around the world means that it's made uh, these crimes easier. They're now estimated to be worth at least 19 to 24 billion dollars a year and a lot more according to some of our sources. I think also on social media, you'll find that the conservation, conversation about conservation and wildlife trade is growing. But I'm afraid that in the journalistic world, the extent of you, why should we worry about that? Because it affects not only the environment and biodiversity, but also hinders social and economic discovered that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's had some serious economic impacts on your part of the world. Um, so it's a good re this, these are among the reasons why, as journalists, you should be interested in this topic. There's no single solution to the problems because they're multifaceted. They're multifaceted. And, um, and we need to make the data and the information about wildlife trafficking accessible to the public in order to counter uh, the associated problems. Yeah. Um, at Oxpeckers, we, as uh, Wendell mentioned earlier, we have pioneered the use of data in telling uh, many environmental stories, including that ar around wildlife crime. Um, and why did we do this? Not only because it's made our lives a lot easier now during this pandemic so that we don't have to go out and see people as much as we used to be able to do, but because um, it's there and it can be used um, if you can unearth it to encourage accountability and also for your stories. Um, data is also used by officials and it provides context, clarity and truth in our stories. The, the way the world handles information has changed significantly in the past decade. And I'm sure that you're all aware of data journalism. It's a, it's a term that's uh, frequently used um, in many different spheres. If we don't unearth this data, it means that there's no real accountability or understanding or buy-in from the public. So, what Oxford started doing in 2012 was to, to start playing around with ways to, do, to use data to tell stories. Just a little bit of background about Oxford, as I mentioned earlier, we're based in South Africa, but we operate in other African countries. And more recently, we've also been operating in Europe and in Asia. Um, and we have got contacts in other parts of the world. But our focus in Africa um, is very much on environmental issues. And we were the first unit that focuses exclusively on environmental issues. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we combine traditional investigative reporting with data analysis and geomapping. And I'll show you a little bit about what that means just now. And we do this in order to track and expose criminals and syndicates involved in eco offenses in Africa and elsewhere. We use this to tell stories which we feature ourselves or with other media partners. We also make our data and our resources available to you and to the public.
Now, I picked up this week that police in Kenya arresting three people with ivory worth 4.8 million Kenyan shillings. They were arrested by the Trans Nzoi County Police following a tip off by members of the public. Um, the suspects were looking for buyers and they were arrested. Now, uh, this photograph here went with a story that was published, which could just be a once-off news story. Um, but I would like to encourage Kenyan journalists to think beyond the fact that these three people were arrested um, and perhaps to dig a bit deeper. This can take time. Um, I mean, I would like to encourage you to follow the court case to find out what has actually happened um, and whether there is an outcome. I would also like to encourage you to follow the trail through the courts. This is what we decided to do with Oxpeckers and it's become a very uh, successful recipe. Um, we started in about 2012 collecting stats on rhino poaching incidents in Southern Africa. Um, and then we also uh, track rhino deaths and poaching arrests. We collect these into data sheets, which we clean, filter, aggregate, and present in a mapping platform in an easily accessible way. I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about uh, poach tracker because I think I need to move on. Um, but Similar to what I was saying about that Kenyan story, our thinking was, okay, so you have rhino poaching incidents where rhinos die, and then you have people caught sometimes. What happens after that? So our next logical step after the poach tracker was to start tracking and mapping data about court cases involving people who are caught while they allegedly. Um, we get our information from the courts, from law enforcement agencies, and often from scraping the web. We, do, we created this platform and this data set because it's very difficult to get rhino poaching related information from alternative sources. I mean, you can spend hours trying to track it down online. You could also do, sometimes it involves doing access to information applications or to going to the courts themselves. And all of these things cost time and money and the outcome is not always guaranteed. But well, what we've done with those data sets is to take them and put them onto the tools uh, that use geomapping um, and filters, analysis, and then we tell stories with that data. Following those two platforms, we then created something called WildEye, uh, which is a platform that I'll show you just now which moved uh, into Europe in 2019 and into Asia in 2020. Once again, it's an open source tool. And now we're very um, definite about the information that we want. So we look at seizures and we look at arrests, but more importantly and more usefully, we're tracking court cases and convictions. Um, we, we, use the, we put these together on a spreadsheet and then we put them onto a mapping platform, which allows you to access this information. It's, this helps to consolidate otherwise random data, which as I said earlier, you can scrape off the web, you can read some of Richard's reports if you'd like. Um, it's available, but it often takes a little bit of searching. Our wild eye tools are tools created by journalists for journalists. So the thinking behind them is to make them helpful to journalists. Um, we then take the data and the map maps and we analyze them um, 
and we tell stories with them in collaborative investigations that are published by ourselves, by Earth Journalism Network, and often by local third party media outlets. This is just a map. I was going to give you an interactive, and I can do that later if you'd like, of how the map different um, menus on this map. So this is Wild Eye Asia. If you click on seizures or you click on arrests, court cases, convictions, or all categories, you'll find a whole lot of little icons pop up depending on what data is available uh, related to your search. For journalists in Kenya, this may be useful in respect of tracking routes. So as you probably know, often ivory or other items of, of wildlife products are shipped offshore and in many instances via Europe or directly to Asia. Um, this box here is an instance of what happens when you use the tool. It brings up a part, if you search, there's a search menu over here. Um, and if you type in Kenya there, you'll get a number of points, not as many as perhaps you'd like, but we're busy building on that data. So what this shows is that these people were all arrested in Singapore in May this year, where they were taking one ton of ivory um, across to Singapore. Now, normally, okay, here there should be a little popper, a little row that says root. And this ivory, this, this particular data point relates to Kenya. As you can see, I think here, somewhere in this write up, there you are, transited through Mombasa ports. So it came from Kenya and went to Singapore. These guys have been arrested in May, if you would like. And then you can subscribe to point changes. So that means that every time we update this data point with information about this case, you will get an email notification that there has been a development on this case. So these can be useful tools to you in Kenya. Um, mostly I'm talking to you about the approach that we've taken, but also I would like to say that as journalists, these are tools that you, in East Africa you can use. Um, okay, so I think I've mentioned that we've got Caesar's arrests, etc. You can track specific trafficking routes, you can track specific cases, individuals or trends. And once again, that's with the search button um, or by working on those menus that show you how many arrests have happened in a particular area, etc. There's a search function in the top left um, and you can subscribe to alerts for updates. We also share our data sets on a link called get the data. So you can actually get the raw data if you want. And you can reach out to us to suggest stories or collaborations. And I'm very quickly going to walk you through some of the collaborations that we have done with journalists in other parts of Africa, not in Kenya. This was a case, for instance, of um, a Thai man who was sentenced to 40 years for using false hunting permits to launder a huge amount of rhino horns from South Africa to Thailand. Um, he was sentenced to 40 years, but was released after ser serving just six years. So this is a long running case that we have been tracking for many years. And uh, unfortunately now that Chumlong has gone back to Thailand. Um, I'm not sure if we're ever going to hear about him again, but we're keeping an eye on him. This was another, this was the case in Mozambique that we used data to investigate and that we're continuing to track where a very well-known and well-respected person 
the uh, son of a Mozambican war hero was arrested with rhino horns. He said that uh, it was a sting operation, so he was released, <clears throat> but we're continuing to track that case. Uh, and then there was a Chinese syndicate in the Namibian court case. Um, and we followed the court case and then an Oxpec is associate based in Asia went and tracked down their families in China to find out a little bit about who they are and um, found that their families actually knew very little about their activities. So these are some of the stories that we have produced as a result of the data that we have tracked and continue to track. Um, and then finally, one thing I would like to mention because you're all based in Kenya is this is slightly off the point, but not, I mean, it's still related to wildlife trafficking. We've been investigating a uh, donkey skin trade for many, many years now. Um, and one of our journalists went into Kenya and did a big story on how, a big investigation on how donkeys are being taken from Ethiopia and Tanzania into Kenya. There's at least four big abattoirs in Kenya. I'm sure you've all heard about uh, a little bit about it anyway. Um, you know, the, the, the skins are then taken off to Asia for a product called Ejao. I think that's how you pronounce it. It is a sort of donkey hide glue that's supposed to, that's being marketed as a product for various ailments. Um, and now what we're currently doing is investigating the link between wildlife tra trade pipelines and the donkey skin trade. So if any of you are interested in that particular angle on wildlife trade, please do get in touch with us. Uh, okay. This is how we work. We're um, expanding our project to feeder regions for global wildlife crime. We use, we do transnational collaborative journalism projects involving teams of data journalists and investigative journalists. Um, we work closely with monitoring organizations, including traffic. Um, and we're creating a community of journalists, researchers, law enforcement agents and conservationists. Um, we do hope that we'll have more members of the team and more collaborations with our East African uh, peers in the future. And that's us. Um, if you want to contact us, we're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, on email, which you'll find on our website. That's me then. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fiona, uh, again, for your insightful uh, presentation and which is, uh, I'd say, you know, very forward thinking, you know, like uh, what uh, Dr. Thomas said, it's uh, this uh, kind of work investigating, you know, wildlife crime is very sophisticated and, uh, you know, it's like a hydra. Uh, you don't know where to start and where to stop, you know, the big, you know, the big cats, uh, so to speak, are uh, never arrested. If they never arrested, uh, the court case doesn't, you know, go through, they are let go. Uh, so I think using those kind of tools is very important to track the story. Like that example you've given, uh, it's amazing to see how the cross-border uh, nature of this crime, you know, like, uh, you know, this turn of shipment of ivory that started in Uganda through Mombasa all the way to Singapore. I think that is a very interesting story that, uh, we can use these tools uh, to 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 able to track, you know, telling the story of the routes, you know, that are followed and you know what happens in between. Uh, it's very important. We do hope we'll we will we will have you uh, some other time where we can go into details ab about these tools and how here in East Africa and in Kenya uh, we can use these and also probably have a wide eye East Africa. And I would like to ask you: Do you have plans for for these now that you have wild eyes? Asia and Europe. I think uh, I think that's a good thing, and we should carry on talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, James is James is listening. Uh, and speaking of which, 
<laughs> yeah, speaking of which, uh, yeah, there are a few questions. I would like to ask that after this, and I would like now to invite uh, James Fan, uh, who is, uh, you know, our director here at Internews EJN. And uh, dear participant, James Lai would like his session to be a bit uh, interactive. So he'll be asking you questions. And uh, if you want to participate, uh, you can, you know, use the icon, raise your hand, and then we allow you to, uh, to we'll un unmute you. So James, uh, the floor is yours and welcome. Thanks everyone. Hi, it's nice to be with you. Um, and uh, it's, uh, thank you for organizing us, Kindu, and very and really interesting to hear from our other speakers, Richard and Fiona. So, um, well, I thought I would, uh, first introduce uh, the Earth Journalism Network, which is hosting this round table and tell you a bit more about ourselves and what we're doing in, uh, in, e in East Africa. Uh, I'll begin by sharing my screen and showing you a presentation like the others. Um, please let me know, can you see my screen okay? Yeah? Okay, so- yes, um, I can see it. Great. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, I'm i the director of Internews' Earth Journalism Network. Internews, you may be familiar with, it's a global media development organization that works, I think we're in over 100 countries now around the world. And the Earth Journalism Network is our environment program, our environmental media program. And our mission is to improve the quantity and quality of uh, environmental coverage around the world by working with journalists such as yourselves. And our mission really is to support, support you to do your work and to help you in any way we can. Um, you can see we're, we're a pretty global operation at this point. We have over 12,000, actually we have now over 12,000 members registered on our website. And uh, if you're not a member yet, it's, it's very easy to go onto our website, earthjournalism.net and Register as a professional journalist. Um, we we do welcome we do welcome you, and it is free to join. Uh, we have we have uh, journalists from over 180 countries around the world, um, and in it we do uh, many different we cover many different topics in the environment. Uh, in addition to uh, wildlife and conservation, we we actually cover all kinds of biodiversity issues, we cover climate change, uh, we support work on ocean uh, and fisheries, on forests, uh, doing more these days on environmental health, especially with the pandemic, there's a lot more interest in, in the connection between environment and health. Um, and we, we try to work in all different formats, so we'll support print, media, TV, radio, online, and, and data journalism, as the kind of data journalism that Fiona has been demonstrating. Uh, and uh, we also do quite a few different types of activities. Um, do a lot of training and workshops like this, this webinar. Now, of course, a lot of our activities have moved online. And um, we, we also give out grants. That's one of our main activities is we provide funding for partners such as yourselves. Uh, some of that funding can go to organizations uh, we, so, for instance, we have supported Fiona and Oxpeckers, not just to do uh, to produce wild eye, but also to do other projects related to environmental journalism. And sometimes our our grants will go to individual journalists to do stories, whether it's investigative stories or feature stories, or uh, you know, we have different types of work that we support. Um, but uh, I I know we just close a, a call for applications for journalists in East Africa who have proposed, uh, we got several dozen applications for, for investigative stories on wildlife and conservation issues. And we'll be reviewing those applications this week and next to determine where we're going, you know, which stories we're gonna support. Um, we support news platforms around the world. Uh, Oxpeckers is, is a, is a good example, but there are others out there too. There's platforms like Info Amazonia uh, in, in the Amazon region, Mekong Eye in Southeast Asia, the Third Pole in India and South Asia, 
Equatorial in Indonesia, uh, Info Congo in Central Africa. Um, we have a site there, um, Info Nile in Uganda. Some of you may have seen that. That's closer to home. I don't. Uh, so, um, you know, those platforms serve as a, a source for news about the environment, about wildlife issues, but and also sometimes for as a as a, a source for data journalism as well. Um, we give out fellowships, uh, so uh, to bring journalists to major conferences and summits around the world. Uh, most years, there's a uh, climate summit, for instance, uh, the UNFCCC climate, uh, Conference of Parties. Of course, this year with COVID, all those conferences have been canceled. It's really a pity because this year, 2020, was supposed to be a very big year for environmental conferences. We were gonna have a major summit on climate change, a major summit on biodiversity in China and a UN ocean conference too in, in Portugal and in Lisbon. And we were bring, planning to bring journalists to all these conferences and they've all been postponed to next year. So, um, well, you know, that also means you still have a chance to apply to some of them next year once applications open up. Uh, and uh, but those are great opportunities for for journalists because you get to produce uh, content, but you also get to learn all about the issues. And and it's really if you've ever been to one of these conferences, it's kind of like it's a really fascinating experience to see how global negotiations go on and how how international policy gets decided. And then finally, we support investigative reports, and that's kind of what this uh, this webinar is about. Of course, uh, we support you know, investigative work into environmental issues and special projects and uh, to uncover what's going on uh, behind the scenes. And um, we work with all different kinds of partner organizations. Um, you know, it could be media outlets, of course, or sometimes uh, NGOs have, uh, op have media operations as well. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in East Africa, we've worked with a group called the Network of Climate Communicators in the Greater Horn of Africa. Uh, we have partners uh, in Tanzania, for instance, we work with the Journalists Environmental Association, or sometimes called JET. In, in Uganda, I mentioned we work with Water Journalists for Africa that runs the Info Nile site uh, in, in Kenya. I know there are Kenyan uh, environment and science journalist associations and other things. Uh, and, and then we can work directly with media outlets as well. The idea is, you know, we support these organizations off, off with training like this webinar, but also again, with, with grants. Um, we have had, we, we tried to track our impacts. So this is something that's kind of interesting. I, I know, uh, you know, journalists don't always uh, look into what is the impact of the story, but we think it's very interesting to understand how does media affect public policy? How does it affect public behavior or, or even just the debate about these issues? So we try and track these things. And so for instance, in Tanzania, uh, one of our members did a story on mining. Um, and, and, and destructive uh, effects of mining. And that resulted in, in the closing down of some of the mining projects. In other countries, uh, at the reporting has helped protect a national park in Vietnam, for instance, shut down factories in China, uh, stopped a major dam from being built in Myanmar. Um, and in Costa Rica, it's contributed to uh, the climate change policy for the country. Uh, and, and in Cambodia, we, uh, our, our partners expose an illegal wildlife smuggling ring and so on. Uh, so it's you know really important, especially these days the media faces a lot of issues, especially financial issues. And we need to show, we need to show what kind of impact we can have. Uh, and so it's important to keep track of the role of the of how media does affect society in a in a positive way, and uh, I know sometimes that can be considered controversial, but that is something we are very always interested in. Um, so, what are we doing in East Africa? 
uh, this uh, webinar is actually part of a larger project that we call East Africa Wildlife Journalism. And the idea here is that we focus on conservation, on wildlife trafficking, on other issues like the human wildlife interface, and also on solutions. You know, how to, you know, we, we don't want to just report on problems, we want to report on solutions as well. Uh, we put on workshops. Uh, last year we did a workshop in Mombasa. Um, uh, obviously, these days it's much more, it's much harder to do workshops in person, so we are doing more virtual activities. Uh, we get, as I mentioned, we give out the story grants, and and we, right now we're reviewing uh, applications for investigative journalism grants, um, and we also give out organizational grants. Uh, to partners. Uh, the, this, the area of focus is four countries, not just Kenya, but also Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda. The money for this, you should always know where your money is coming from. The money is, this, is coming from the US government, from US Agency for International Development and the Department of Interior. Um, uh, we have actually, Internews, our parent organization has a, a, a long standing history in East Africa. We have major office in Nairobi that runs all kinds of projects, not just on environment, but on health and, and press freedom and on different issues. And we also have uh, offices elsewhere in East Africa, I know in, in Dar es Salaam and elsewhere. Um, so, and we have other projects in Africa as well. We, again, I mentioned the, the fellowships and the grants, uh, We've had workshops on agriculture, on climate finance, on fisheries in West Africa. We've done focused a lot on fisheries, not so much in East Africa, although that would be interesting too. We've done workshops on data journalism in places like Nigeria. Um, but to talk a little bit more in detail about wildlife trafficking and why it's so important, of course, Richard and Fiona have both uh, spoken to that. I'll just add a little bit. Um, the, it's hard to know, of course, how, how big the trade is, the illegal trade. It's been estimated at about $23 billion per year. Um, and, that, and that would make it the fourth largest illegal trade after uh, trade in drugs and people and weapons. Uh, but if you include uh, illegal fishing and timber, as, as Richard indicated, those are really, those are really big, uh, uh, the big flow, there are really big flows in these products, then the estimated value of this illegal trade each year is $180 billion. This is according to an expert named Adrian Reuter, and that would make it second only to drugs trafficking. Now, this estimate is a few years old now, so it probably needs to be updated, and I, I, I bet it's, it's larger these days because, um, of course, the economic pressures from the COVID pandemic have have, as best as we can determine, increased uh, illegal activities. So you can see this is a really big issue. It goes on behind the scenes. And our role as journalists, hopefully, is to help uncover some of that. East Africa, as we've heard, is a, is a source of supply for uh, wildlife trade. It's also a transshipment hub. The ports are a very important uh, place to investigate. And, and, and there's demand for wildlife products of course, there's bushmeat, um, uh, it, you know, illegal, uh, illegal poaching that's used to provide food, um, but also other products, especially um, things like medicines. Um, and it's underreported. Usually, as we've heard uh, from Fiona, that there's, um, you know, sometimes you only hear news about this when there's a bust, there's an arrest. And really, one of our, our goals is to expand that reporting and follow not just the court cases, but you know, uncover what's going on in the field. Um, it's not an easy thing to do to report on this, as you probably know. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of challenges, and I'm happy to talk about this with you uh, uh, in a discussion and to talk about, well, you know, how, how do you go about reporting on uh, wildlife and, and uh, illegal trafficking? Uh, one of the main challenges is simply a lack of time, a lack of money. Um, 
to, you know, it does take time and, and money to go out and do this investigative work, as you're probably aware. And, you know, sometimes there's even resistance within the newsroom. Maybe uh, some editors uh, don't think it's that important issue. And really, sometimes it's up to us to explain why this is so important and why it's, you know, we need to protect wildlife for partly for economic reasons, but also just to prevent extinction of species, for instance. And sometimes we get threats for, for you know, doing these stories. We get threats from vested interests. This is criminal enterprise. And, you know, it's really important to take those threats seriously and, and to maintain your safety. Um, stories, as we've heard, uh, especially from Richard, stories about the, the so-called, the, the big species, the big, for the big six, uh, the charismatic megafauna, as it's some kind of sometimes called. Those stories are pretty popular. Um, but the question for us is, how do you make a good story out of the less popular wildlife? And how uh, the broader importance of the web of life, of biodiversity? And as, as Richard showed, uh, you know, the, the trade in, in elephant ivory and rhino horn, that's important. But it's also just one piece of the picture. And there's so many other issues out there related to wildlife that don't get as much coverage. I know one of the stories we recently supported in Kenya, for instance, looked into the illegal trade in snakes and vipers. Uh, that's really interesting. And, and there's a lot of that going on and it doesn't get as much coverage as, as other major issues. Um, kind of the broader challenge we face is how do you you know, take this global, take global issues like illegal trade in wildlife and turn them into local stories. And we do have some, uh, you know, tips for how to do that. Uh, of course, the main tip you may have heard before, but it, it's really one thing you can do is focus on the people involved, the scientists who are trying to protect wildlife, uh, the conservationists who are also doing the same, uh, maybe the, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, maybe a police or law enforcement people, prosecutors who are working to crack down on this. That, that can be an interesting angle. Uh, another good approach is to focus on places. Uh, obviously, there are famous places like Masai Mara in Kenya, but there are also many places that, that don't get as much attention and are very important ecosystems or or national parks or wilderness areas and 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 people, you know, audiences are often very interested in learning about these places. You can focus on the useful characteristics or unique uh, species that are out there. So, you know, a lot of uh, species uh, are, are valuable for, for things like medicine and, and or, or have interesting uh, characteristics that make them in, uh, a good focus for stories. Of course, that also makes them a target for the trade, but uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes a lot of these creatures are, are more valuable alive than dead. So that can be a good focus for a story. There's another uh, angle that can be really interesting to focus on. It's something we call trophic cascades. And I know that's a, a difficult term, but what we see in nature is that, you know, when you add or remove a species from the ecosystem, it has uh, a cascade effect. It affects other species and the whole ecosystem as a whole. Uh, there's a very famous example of this uh, in, in the US where, where I'm based, um, you know, when about, uh, I guess it's 25 years ago now, uh, the authorities, um, brought wolves back to Yellowstone. Wolves have been exterminated for most of the continental United States a century ago. Um, and there was a big move to reintroduce them into the, the, the uh, to this park, this famous national park called Yellowstone. Um, and when you remove or reintroduce an apex predator like a wolf, it has amazing impacts on the whole ecosystem. So in this case, for instance, uh, when they reintroduced wolves, that created what's called a landscape of fear. That meant that the elk and the bison in the park 
can no longer eat wherever they want and can no longer just, you know, uh, graze and, and, and uh, kind of prevent, uh, you know, graze wherever they liked. And uh, before the wolves were there, they, they were grazing so much and e eating so much that a lot of tree species can no longer grow, especially along the riverbanks. So when the wolves are reintroduced, uh, the, 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 the elk and bison, the prey species uh, can no longer graze as much. And that led to more growth of trees like uh, aspen and uh, other, other species along the rivers. As those trees grew back, it created more shade along the rivers and that led to more fish species being able to feed and breed along the riverbanks. So you can see, just as an example, introducing this, this one species back into the ecosystem led to a lot of different and positive changes to help bring back other, other kinds of species. So it's really important to understand uh, these trophic cascades and understand how species interact with each other and how it's important and, and the importance of, of having uh, all these species. And then, um, you know, it's also good to think about solutions and, and innovative ways that we can help species to thrive and survive. A, a, a good example in East Africa, I know, is, uh, you know, comes with the, um, there's a big problem between wildlife uh, and human interactions. Like uh, we had, I know there are many problems with elephants, for instance, um, uh, trampling on farmers' crops or, or eating farmers' crops. And, but there are ways to prevent that. And one of the ways, of course, we've heard about in East Africa is to create fencing with, with beehives. Uh, elephants are afraid of beehives, are, are afraid of bees. And so by if farmers and, and communities set up uh, bees, beehives around their, their crops, around their farmland, that can help scare away elephants without having to kill them. Um, so there are other different solu innovative, innovative solutions out there, and that is another good topic for stories. Um, just uh, quickly, we've also been focusing on wildlife trafficking in other regions, especially in Europe and Asia. We just completed a project in Europe that that, uh, that was the project where we worked, for instance, with oxpeckers to create the wild eye online map. Um, and we gave out investigative story grants there. Uh, we did some, some workshops and, and we again, we've seen a lot of really interesting stories come out of there. Stories on poaching of songbirds, for instance, on trade in, in, in fish species. Uh, uh, you know, there's a, a whole big trade, not just in fish for food, but also ornamental fish. Um, a lot of interesting, uh, species that we don't often think about, but that, which there is a legal trade in. Um, and we have another project that's uh, starting up again called the Biodiversity Media Initiative. Uh, this is a, a project that supports coverage of biodiversity around the, the, the global, global South, around the developing world. And again, we're giving out story grants and media grants. Um, and uh, we recently sought applications for organizational grants, but uh, later in the, probably later this month, um, there will be another opportunity to apply for story grants about biodiversity. So if you have an interesting story on biodiversity that you want to cover, but you need some funding or money uh, to, to do that work, you can apply for that. It's, it, it is competitive, I have to say, we get a lot of applications, but if you have a good idea, you should definitely apply. And, you know, uh, and what, once we learn about the stories, you know, even if we can't always fund them right away, we can stay in touch and there'll be other opportunities in the future. And we've, we've done, uh, we've also supported investigative stories on pangolin trade in, in Asia and Africa. We've supported investigative stories on the Belt and Road Initiative. You may be familiar with that. That's a big uh, infrastructure uh, pro investment campaign supported by China, and that's having an impact on environment around the world. 
There are many other ways to uh, engage with the Earth Journalism Network. I mentioned the story grants uh, and the fellowships. We have uh, all kinds of discussion groups online. We have a, a, a Google group called EJNet where you know, journalists from around the world communicate with each other through email. Of course, we have uh, pages on Facebook and Instagram and, and a Twitter feed as well. Um, you can you can register again. I urge you, if you're not a member of EarthJournalism.net, to to register on our website. Um, and you know, we we're always happy to to learn about the work you're doing. And if we can help, we we certainly would be interested in doing that. Um, um, I think that's about it from me for now. I'm happy to talk more. And as Kindu said, to lead to lead a discussion on how we can go about doing some of this investigative work, where, what kind of sources we use uh, to do that work. Do that work, do that work, do that work. But I'm gonna turn it back over to Kundu for them for now. I know we have an, another speaker, so thank you for, for your time and your attention. Yes, James, uh, we have uh, the last speaker. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your very engaging um, a presentation and for the, you know, uh, taking us, uh, showing us the work, uh, the great work that EJN has done and continues to do. And, and I think uh, looking at the uh, examples from you and Fiona, we see, especially from elsewhere, uh, uh, from uh, Africa and Europe, and I think it's a challenge for us here in East Africa uh, to do more of these kind of work and to even collaborate more and to work closely with us here at EJN because of, of all the support, you know, that Intern is continues to do and that you've highlighted. Uh, so we'll come to questions uh, later. So kindly uh, ask your questions on Q&A. Again, I've seen a couple. And then Q, uh, I've seen Thomas, uh, Dr. Thomas, and also Fiona answering, answering a couple of those and even uh, sharing the contact. Uh, so I think uh, we the, the time is really gone. Uh, we'll hurry this up. Uh, Dennis, uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, better position, uh, looking brighter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, welcome. Uh, tell us about uh, how you go about doing your great work. Uh, I know we have people who don't know you. Probably I didn't do justice to your introduction. Uh, you can tell us a bit of your work and, and then you can share with us how we able uh, to use experience to investigate on wildlife and other environmental crime. Uh, Karibu sana. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope I'm clear. Uh, I'm somewhere in the village and I was driving when uh, you were doing the introductions. I'm now settled somewhere where hopefully the network is good. Uh, you can hear me clearly? Loud and clear, very good. Ah, great. Uh, great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate all the speakers who have just spoken right before I did. And uh, very interesting points um, that, you know, I was actually writing down my own personal notes from the conversations that I was listening to from Fiona and then Richard and James also, uh, who I think threw in a challenge to myself and other investigative reporters on you know, how to address the impact of some of these stories that we do and tracking them and uh, just working on the effects of some of this story. I know in the media space, we are very good with very sensational stories. And uh, more often than not, you will find environmental stories or the wildlife stories don't really make it um, to the top pecking order, so to speak. And there are reasons for that. Um, I have, I think, a very few minutes, I may not be able to address all that, but you've asked me to talk about uh, some of the things that I've done. For the last 17 years, I've done quite a lot, and I'll just uh, gravitate towards what I'm always interested in. I'm very, very keen on matters of security. Um, it's, it's a passion for me, matters of security and uh, health and the environment. Those three are key for me. Um, Initially, when you introduced me, you talked about um, uh, me being a certified war journalist. Um, it takes special training for someone like myself. And uh, I trained in um, the UK and also in Turkey with the special forces in the two countries. 
And uh, the reason for the training was we were experiencing terror attacks in, uh, in the continent. And from West Africa, from Boko Haram, it was moving so fast to the East African region. And therefore, I felt there was a need for me to get better training because we mishandled, as the media, the Westgate events uh, back in 2013. And it was so unfortunate how things turned out. But we all had learning lessons. The government, you know, um, learned quite a lot. Uh, we in the media space also learned quite a lot. But it was important to increase the knowledge and just to know how can you handle uh, yourself and still do your story in a conflict zone, in a war zone? How do you even survive there? And therefore, I've gone for it, uh, um, enough training with special forces and security and emergency teams in all these countries that I've traveled to. And so that's the reason why I'm a certified uh, war journalist. I can survive in Somalia. I can survive in any war zone, in any conflict zone and still be able to do my job. Now, today, um, what I really wanted to um, talk about is just quite a few things from the header you gave, uh, exploring tools that I use in my reporting and talking about how I, they, those tools can be used to investigate wildlife and environmental crime stories. I'll start from, um, from this very, very basic point. Uh, sometimes uh, a lot of reporters that I've come across and many journalists who want to venture into investigative reporting, they sort of think there is, uh, you know, there's magic in coming around those kind of stories or there are secrets around um, uh, doing investigative reporting or there's something special about uh, reporters like myself or journalists like myself working on investigative stories? And the answer is not. It's far from the truth. It's the very simple things, everyday things that you and I observe. As a matter of fact, you don't even need to be a journalist to pick out uh, this kind of stories that, you know, um, are just around us. It's as simple as talking to someone who's not even in the journalism field and asking them questions, questions around wildlife, questions about the environment, what are their concerns? And for me, these are the tools that I use to work on my stories. And by tools, I mean this. It's the very, very basic things, the questions. That's the biggest tool that any journalist can have. I'm not talking about having a camera or a voice recorder or a pen or notebook. Those are what will help you in working on the story. But the biggest tool uh, at your disposal as a journalist is asking the questions and asking the right questions. And in your quest to get the answers, it's, an, it's a whole journey. It's an adventure in itself. And through that journey, you end up picking out a lot of things that you are not aware of. And things that, for example, asking someone a question about the general feel of the environment. And I'll give you an example. Sometime last year, I was working on a story on the Nairobi National Park. It was about the environment. And there were concerns that, you know, the SGR was going to pass through the park and uh, environmentalists were up in arms against this. Lobby groups, the NGOs were coming up and saying, you know, the government shouldn't do this. The government was giving its reason for building the SGR, um, the rail network, uh, from Mombasa all the way to the western part of the country, and they needed to pass through the park. Now, a lot of people on social media who are support, in support of, of, of the project uh, lost the argument. And the idea was this, how many people go to the park? How often do you go to the park? And a lot of people are saying, I go to the park maybe once in three years, Largely, it's the tourists who come into the country who care about our national parks and our animals. And that is right. Most of them are actually right because we have fewer people who pay to go to these national parks. But those are the locals. Now, the second question is, why in any case do we need the national park? Why do we need it? And to surprise you, there are a lot of learned people, people with knowledge who've gone to school, who don't understand the one very simple reason why having the park is so important to the people living in the capital. And it's because Nairobi National Park, I'm using that story as an example, is the, is the, Nairobi, the park itself is the lungs to the city. And when I say lungs, this is what I mean. The park provides oxygen for the city. It provides the cooling and the cleaning of the air for the city. 
So when you are driving through traffic, the pollution that we are experiencing around us, nobody ever thinks what cleans this pollution in the air. It is basically the park that is really, really helping. And now when you go to the very basics to answer the question of why the park is important to a layman or someone who is not even interested in visiting the park is to answer this simple question. If you get rid of the park, you will be breathing toxins and fumes in the air. Is this what you want? And their answer will be absolutely no. And this is the, is the effect of getting rid of the park. These are the effects. And you put all those things down. It's answering the question, like I say, which is your big tool. So it makes sense. And now it becomes very relevant to anyone to watch that kind of story or to listen to your argument or to even listen or read an article around that subject. And when you now start going digging deeper, uh, because if there's a very thin line between you know the ordinary stories that we do every day, what in the newsroom we call the docket stories, and special projects, and uh, in this case, investigative stories. And the idea around it is because it takes a lot of time. And I will take you through my process so that you're able to pick out a few things here and there. Uh, like those who have gone before me, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just telling a story and I'll just tell you stories. My process is very, very simple. The first thing I ask myself, why does this story matter? Why does, why, why care about wildlife? Why care about the environment? If I'm not able to answer that question myself, then the next thing will be to start digging and to find out why does it really matter to me? How does it affect me as a journalist? Because more often than not, when working on these kind of stories, as journalists, there's the temptation to divorce ourselves and separate ourselves from the stories. You realize with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, whether you're working on a story or not, it affects you as a journalist in the newsroom as much as it affects your grandmother or your grandfather back in the village. All of us are affected. So while covering these kind of stories is what kind of impact or effect will this have on me? And therefore, it starts from a personal view. Now, from a personal view, start broadening it out and include other people's views. And when I'm talking about other people's views, it's not engaging just the professionals. It's engaging people who may not even have a clue or an idea what you're talking about, but turning the question around and ask them, would you be interested in finding out why it's important to preserve our wildlife? Is, uh, would you care to know uh, how many lions we have in the country, how many zebras we have in the country, for example? Get to, hear the, get to hear the tone around their answers. It will give you an idea on how to approach um, that kind of story. For me, my process starts out of 100%, 80% is on research. And the things that we have an advantage of is, uh, especially today, is uh, something I call digital research tools. And with the digital research tools is from just sitting at home, you're able to go on the internet and begin asking the internet questions and the internet will give you answers, all right? From that point, um, I take time to do a lot of research and part of the research includes reading a lot. It's finding out what's, what are the regulations? What does the law say about our environment? Because our laws and regulations are different from Tanzania or from the United States of America or even inter-county. The county of Nairobi could be different from the county of Wasingishu, for example. So 80% is on research. I read a lot. I, in, I get a lot of information. Now, consuming a lot of data also runs you into a risk. There is also the danger of falling prey into fake news and fake information. Now, that's where I go into the second stage. The second stage involves now speaking to experts. And what I do is I always go with my notebook and my pen and talk to experts in that field. And I'll give you an example, going to the park, apart from talking to the rangers, for example, I keep going to the park because that's a story I worked on at the time. And what I was interested in is I wanted to hear from the rangers, sitting down with them, having coffee or tea and just having a conversation without recording anything and just talking and just listening to them. Then the second part is now get outside, talk to the guards. Then there are those people who are selling artifacts. You just get to listen to what they think, what they understand around uh, the issues of wildlife, for example. 
when you're talking about the environment, speaking to people who live along danger zones. And an example is, for example, pollution through our rivers. Apart from talking to the experts is go step into the shoes of those people who live close to those places, feel what they feel, understand the things they go through on a daily, uh, on, on their day in their, in their daily lives and um, fitting into their normalcy um, for lack of a better word. So 80% of my time is spent on research and the tools, like I said, is the questions that you're asking. Those are your biggest tools. Now, the 10% is on the writing part. That's the scripting part. And then lastly, the other 10% is in the editing. That's the easy part. To put a story together is not necessarily difficult, but gathering all the information is what is important. James uh, talked about the effects of mining in Tanzania as an example, and I was listening to him talking. And uh, he, there's something, there's a very, very good point James uh, brought out, the impact. So why should anyone care about these stories anyway? What's the impact? Um, and this is now where you have to really, really define the crime itself. So defining the crime itself is for this simple reason. There are cultures in our country and there are people in our country who don't believe that when you're killing wild, uh, wild animals, it is wrong. The law may say what it is saying, but culturally speaking, they tend to believe that there's nothing wrong that they're doing. You know, killing an elephant and eating elephant meat, there's nothing wrong with it. So you have to address the culture issues. How do you get these people to understand the impact of killing our wildlife? How do you get to explain to someone who is in Turkana that, you know, the poaching of elephants um, in Savo um, has this kind of effect? What's the impact for them? Why should they care? And this is now where you move from localizing the idea of the story and taking it to their and taking it outside so that it can make it can bring meaning to them, contextualize the story around someone who is in Turkana or someone who's doing fishing in Lake Victoria. This is why you should care that we are having enough poachers in the country who are destroying our wildlife. This is why you should care that we're degrading our rivers and we're polluting our environment and we're encroaching on the national parks. This is why it is important for you to care. So once you do that, the other thing is, what is the threat? So if we eliminate the lions or the elephants, what is the threat to, to the ecosystem? Now, a lot of these things are very, very scientific. And that's why sometimes uh, for many journalists that have come across, including myself, before delving into this subject, is gathering evidence and gathering information around a lot of these things require scientific proof, all right? And when it gets to science, you're getting into a lot of detail. And sometimes explaining science to people can be so challenging. And the language that you will use for people to understand can be so challenging. And a lot of people just give up. And that's why you don't find many journalists who care or even in the newsrooms, and I'm speaking as an editor, if you bring me a story about um, BBI, for example, and you bring me a story about three lions have been killed in a park somewhere, or this river has been polluted to this level, chances are I will pick the BBI story. And this is the reason why. It is because for many years in our newsrooms, we've never really thought about the prominence of these stories because we focus so much on politics and our newsrooms are so politicized in nature such that we always think that's where the stories will come from. But the, the environmental stories are coming in. And this is what is interesting. When you talk about wildlife and you talk about the environment, it's interconnected and related to our health at the end of the day. So you can't separate the two because if you are, if, you, if we are destroying our parks or we are destroying our wildlife, it has an effect to our health. It may not be me today, but it may be in the next generation or the second or even the third generation. What kind of world do we want to live in when we continue seeing these things you know, persist? So it's a conversation we're having in the newsrooms. And that's the reason why, and I'll give you an example. For example, at NTV where I work, we have a science desk. We have a health desk. Now, Lately, what we also do have is a desk that focuses on stories about the environment. 
and getting journalists who are interested in getting into this, into this field can be a bit problematic because everyone wants to do politics, everyone wants to do investigative stories concern, uh, concerning security, terrorism, corruption, and everything else. And while I might say that you know it gets the most clicks and it's tweeted a lot, but there is a space that is coming up so strongly around the environment issues and, and, and all that. And just to, you know, to summarize, as I wind up, I talked about the biggest tool being the questions that we ask as investigative journalists. If you don't have the right questions, you may have the best camera, you may have the best audio recorder, you may have a good notebook and a pen, you may have um, a good team around you, but it's worth nothing. But when you have the right questions and you begin to pursue those questions to get the answers relentlessly, then it will lead you somewhere. So digital research tools using the internet, it will give you a lot. There are a lot of people have talked about this and I've covered this quite extensively. And how the second question is then from all this data that you're collecting, how do you manage the evidence for your story? Remember as a journalist, you are building a case, not just a story. It's a case you're building. You're taking a story on wildlife or the environment and you're taking it to the public. What you're doing is you're taking a case to the public through media, whether it's TV, radio or print, and you're telling them, this is my case. The question again is, how do you support your case? Now, this is where you now look at the different elements that help you build up your case. I had, um, I had James talk about, you know, speaking to some of these experts, you know, the professionals, which is very, very important, but also speaking to those who are largely affected. And um, lastly, how do you merge all this data, sieve out fake information and fake news and all that, and you gather all this information from all these places, sieve it together. Now, this is what I always do. I always have a focus group. And it's important to have a focus group where you're presenting a case to them before it goes public. And you're telling them, this is my case. What do you think I'm missing? And I have found people who don't work in the newsroom, people who don't even understand what journalism is all about. Sometimes we pick out things that we miss and the, uh, um, the things that we miss in our stories. And you're able to now bridge in the missing links and put everything together. So my process, like I said, is simple. There are no secrets to this, is get passionate, get interested, get immersed and relentlessly pursue answers to the question that we're asking today. I have done this for 17 years, but I will tell you for the last, the first 10, there was no real impact in the stories I was telling, but you know, you have to keep on pushing. You have to keep on pulling your weight around telling this story and becoming so passionate about it. Someone somewhere is going to take notice and people will listen and watch what you have to do. I will finish by you know, telling you the story that I did just the other day on COVID. And surprisingly, crime and corruption doesn't, is not respected to time. You, we, you will assume that because of COVID-19, we don't have poachers. You will assume that because of COVID-19 and the quarantine and the lockdowns and everything, you'll assume that there's no crime being committed somewhere. But you'll be surprised, a lot is going on out there. Now the question, um, the question now, when I was digging around COVID-19 stories because it's concerning our health and the environment again, because we are talking about China and uh, the genesis of all this coming from China, but isolating COVID-19 as a virus in itself and doing a story is not fruitful. It's going back to it. How did it start in China? It's about the environment. Again, we go back to that same very, very question. Until we address the environment question in the room, then we'll be going around some of these stories and we'll keep repeating these stories. And we have seen a tendency where, especially in Kenya right now, where people are fatigued uh, when you keep repeating certain stories, where you keep insisting that we need to preserve this, we need to do this. People are so fatigued so quickly and people forget and move on so quickly. But there's always um, a point to keep reminding ourselves and keep reminding the public, keep informing the public, not getting tired to inform them. And therefore, for me, the question was, we have COVID-19. People are still stealing this corruption around COVID-19. People are stealing supplies uh, and, and, and all that. 
Uh, I don't want to give in so much, but I'm currently working on a story now around the environment and how it's connected to COVID-19 going all the way to China. And uh, we are living in interesting times. There is room to work on these kind of stories and that's the future of journalism because people are getting tired of the politics because of bad politics. We have bad environments. We have, um, we have destroyed our environment. We have destroyed our wildlife and all that. It's all connected to politics, but let's go to the root cause of this and, uh, and, um, and address the impact and the effects of what is going on and the politics will come into play. Thank you very much. Wow, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dennis Okari. I've picked a lot of things. Uh, I don't know what to, you know, what to mention. Uh, but but uh, I think uh, the takeaway home uh, for everyone here, especially the journalists, is uh, you know these simple tools. You know, uh, keeping it simple and uh, you know, like asking questions. You know, good old journalism. I, you know, I think that's you know really awesome, and, and that you question a lot, you ask good questions, and you also read a lot are very important. Uh, most of us don't do that. And uh, also something personally, when I was practicing as a journalist, I've never done is, you know, like, uh, you know, focus groups, you know, that's very important when you're doing a story that you're not quite sure of and you run it with people who are actually non, you know, media people, uh, that's very interesting. And, and also uh, the story you're pursuing, uh, I hope uh, you can allow us to, you know, talk about it uh, because you're also very interested in, you know, these emerging uh, diseases, uh, zoonotic diseases, uh, as, you, as you had uh, with the, uh, Dr. Thomas here, that was our first website. And now we are we really telling our, uh, our members that uh, we can't do stories of health and environment in exclusivity. They are mutually exclusive, uh, what basically is called, you know, one health, that is human health, environment, and also, and also the, you know, uh, the, the planet health. So thank you so much, uh, Dennis. There is a couple of questions, you know, that I come to. Uh, to ask on that. And I've seen a couple of you guys tweeting. Uh, thank you so much uh, for tweeting about this. And for those who have not, please uh, retweet uh, so that we can reach as uh, many people that we can, uh, as possible. Um, the several questions, uh, I think I should start uh, with one. But And guys, you're not saying your name. You're not telling us uh, who you work for. And be, because this one, you know, somebody who's joined with his phone, saying he's researching on the illegal fish trade in Africa, but the more questions he asks, the more dangerous the, oops, I can't get that question. I've been researching on the illegal fish trade in Africa, but the more questions I ask, the more dangerous it's my question is, is that, what is the most equipped way to get information from these people? Okay, <laughs> anyone can take that, uh, probably Dennis. And uh, let's go to Kevin Lunzaru. He's thanking Dr. Thomas uh, for such insightful presentation. Uh, he's, uh, he's a freelance environmental journalist uh, based here in Kenya. Uh, he's wondering if you consider African gray parrot as one of the most feral species. He's not seeing this on your list. He's also wondering which mechanism traffic is putting in place to cope with the ever increasing sophistication in mechanisms and technology that aid wildlife trade and last. We understand that CITES monitors wildlife trade across regions. How easy is it to differentiate products of legal uh, trade uh, from the illegal ones? Um, uh, Fiona, let me ask this uh, to Fiona also so we can take this as one. Um, this is Kevin again. I would like to know if Wildjai considers biopiracy as a form of illegal wildlife trade, and if so, are the tools capable of tracking the trade, especially in lower plants and animals? Secondly, we are aware that one of the goals of the Convention of Biological Diversity, a multilateral treaty to which many African countries, including Kenya, are part of, is to enhance sustainable utilization of biological resources. Does this in any way promote illegal wildlife trade or make mapping and tracking of the same difficult? Um, Fiona, this uh, guy seems very knowledgeable uh, on this area. Uh, so hope you could take that. Uh, can we start with you, Dennis? Uh, the first question, it's a bit complicated. You're on mute, Dennis. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just remind me again the first question. 
I'm researching on illegal fish trade in Africa, and the more questions I ask, the more dangerous it gets. You know, like he's uh, investigating on this particular story, can happen to any story, but the more he digs for this story, it seems to, to get more dangerous on his life. I think that's what he wants to ask. Uh, what would you say about this? That well, um, do you stop doing the story if it gets uh, dangerous uh, to you? This is this is what I will say. Um, the first thing is this: um, when working these kind of stories, and I've I've come across those kind of situations. Uh, I mean, it's like, it's nearly like all the time while working on investigative stories because you are touching on corruption, you're touching on crime and whatnot, and there are people who will not be happy with your work. But this is what I always say. A story is never important than your life. Uh, you're able to tell levels of danger. If it gets you to a point where you are fearful for your life and it could cost you your life, then at, at all costs, just stop it. There's no story worth your life. That's the first thing you need to, 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 to remember. You don't want to, to die a hero working on a certain story because you have a life outside journalism, outside that story of a life and you have a family. So while working on these kind of stories, what you do is you always work with, um, I don't know whether they're working for an organization, you always work with a team and you always do a risk assessment before working on these kind of stories. And sometimes with a risk assessment, you never get everything before you start pursuing a story. Some of these things emerge as you're working on the story or even at the tail end of the story. So it's important to work with a team that um, also puts you in check, follows you up to keep assessing every step uh, of your research and uh, while working on this story to look at the threat level. And if the threat level is high, that's the point where now you take, um, depending on where you work and the group that you're dealing with, that's where now you take the next step. You either hold the story and let uh, and give yourself some time, give yourself some space um, uh, around uh, around the story. The other, and then you can come back to it much much later. But if it is a story that you know needs to be done so quickly, because you're working with a team, you don't necessarily have to go out and do it yourself. You can always go and work with other people, you know, and. Um, Can you hear me? Uh, Dennis, Fred, we're losing you. So can you hear me? Yes, are you on and off, you're breaking, and I had to stop your video, but still, yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Oh, great, 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 you, you, you can Go start the video. So uh, like I was saying, uh, just assess the risk levels, work with the team, and every step of the way, always just take notes, um, uh, always take notes, um, of what you're doing. The other thing is you can, before working on a, you know, there's a way as an investigative reporter, sometimes while working on a story, you're able to sit down and tell what are the likely dangers that can come out of working on a story like this one. And that's where you can choose to stay anonymous or use somebody else, um, uh, a source um, or use a fixer to get you certain things that you can't physically go to get. And I've done that quite a lot. And I'll give you an example. I worked on a story called the Quack Clinic. And because obviously I was known and the danger of the person I was investigating, I used um, a fixer and I was working together with a fixer who was getting me the information, getting me the footage, and we worked and collaborated together. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can pursue a story while going to the field and have a security consultant with you or our security personnel with you. We as journalists have done that uh, a lot of times where you're able to go with security, especially if you're driving to a dangerous place or attach yourself with an organization. And I'll give an example. Uh, I was working on a story in Pokot and we were working uh, with the, the Kenya Red Cross at the time. And I was pursuing a story on the bandits in that region. And uh, before working on the story, the information I got while doing our you know, while putting our heads together to, to decide on what to do, was that if you use personal vehicles, they'll shoot you, they'll kill you. But if you go under the umbrella of the Kenya Red Cross, from, for example, because they are known to help those people there, then it, it will be easy for you to access those, those areas. So you look at all these things, which group, which organization, which people can you 
uh, go with to access certain areas or access certain information and, um, and all that, yes. I hope I've really answered the question. Yes, you have, uh, Dennis. Thank you so much uh, for articulating that. Uh, I hope your question has been really answered. Uh, if we could go now to Fiona, we have about 10 minutes uh, to answer about 14 questions. I don't know if you're able to make all of these. Fiona, uh, Kevin Lunzeru's uh, question, and then we go to Dr. Thomas. Right. 10 minutes to answer this question. No. <laughs> Uh, Kevin. Sorry? I said, did you say I've got 10 minutes to answer this question? No, oh, no, we've questions. got 10 minutes to answer all the all the questions. Okay, yeah, so you've short. got less I'll than a minute. It, I'll keep it short, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, bio pir I guess biopiracy, as the name implies, is a form of, bi of piracy. So if it's illegal, then we will track it. Um, so that answers that. I mean, just because they're so-called lower plants and animals doesn't mean we're not interested in them. If it's illegal, it's illegal. Um, and that can be open to interpretation. But anyway, um, about the CBD question, look, sustainable utilization is a controversial issue between uh, Southern Africa and Eastern Africa. It's not for me to take a stance, but just to say that um, I do believe that uh, trade, legal trade can, there is an argument that legal trade encourages illegal trade in wildlife and in other commodities. Um, so that's a big debate that obviously we don't have question, uh, time to go into right now. Thanks for your, your very good questions, Kevin. Uh, thank you so much, Fiona. Uh, Richard, there's a question also by uh, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for your question, Kevin, about the uh, African grey. Um, yes, it, it wasn't on the uh, list of species I, I showed, but um, it could well have been. I mean, it's uh, uh, I could have chosen dozens of different species there, and they've all got interesting tales behind them. I mean, the African grey uh, is a very good example of a, a bird that um, is uh, collected from the wilds, but they're passed off as being captive bred. And there's a huge racket in that uh, because what, once they're captive bred, they fall into different regulations, societies. But they, you know, I could have chosen other bird species. Uh, your crown cranes are also being uh, trafficked. Uh, also in East Africa, birds like the shoebill are in uh, illegal trade too. And there's a very interesting new dynamic that um, I've, no, I've not heard reported on from the African side. Uh, of the equation in the bird trade is that in parts of Asia they're literally running out of some bird species and they're starting to source similar species from Africa so I'm thinking in particular of the white eyes that are very very popular as cage birds uh, in particularly Indonesia but other parts of Southeast Asia and they basically denuded their forests of these birds and so they're now starting to come across to Africa and they're, they're getting Abyssinian white eyes uh, from Ethiopia. And I expect that is something that will be uh, increasing over the years. Um, and it's something to be on the lookout for. And there's a, there's a top tip for a potential story for someone. Okay, um, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I, I'm going through these questions. And I, I think most of them have been answered in one form or the other. Uh, let me see. Um, this one, I, I think anyone can answer. Uh, from a Congo Duya, an environmental reporter based in Busia, that's uh, the Kenya Uganda border. He says there is rampant trafficking of wildlife and wildlife products, but getting the authorities to give you information is, is too hard. How do you proceed with a story where no one is willing to give you information you're looking for? I, I think we've answer that in one way or the other, not unless there is a panelist uh, who would like to answer these. Uh, Achola Mathis is uh, mostly saying he's very, uh, you know, he's been impressed by the pan panelists. Uh, I don't think you have any question. Uh, Mila Muregi here, I would like to have more information about illegal uh, timber trade. Uh, Thomas, uh, do you have any information on that? 
Uh, certainly, yeah. If he wants to drop me an email, I can provide him quite a lot of information about uh, timber trade uh, in uh, particularly, um, well, we, we, we've done a number of studies in Namibia, uh, uh, Zambia, uh, but I don't think we've done anything for Kenya, Madagascar as well, but I'd be happy to uh, point him to uh, those, those articles. Okay. Uh, Dennis, there are so many questions uh, for you, which I think you've touched in some way. There is Dan Kaburu from K24, who is also asking questions that I think we've answered. Uh, James, uh, he's asking, uh, he says, it's a uh, lack of training on investigative reporting, whether on environment, conservation stories, or other stories is a major challenge in Kenya. Is there any way internet can help journalists? I think we've addressed this, but unless you'd like to take it further, James. Well, yeah, that's one of our roles is to do more training on uh, wildlife issues and investigative journalism there. Besides this workshop, I know we're doing other workshops in other countries around the region. Um, you know, right now, we're not sure what further training we're going to be able to do, but um, I, I, I know that we're hoping to continue this project after next year or so please, you know, stay in touch. It might take some time before we can offer new training again, but uh, I think we're optimistic that we'll be able to do more, uh, if not next year, than the following year. And, and, and I would certainly urge anyone who's interested, uh, I've seen people write, some people write questions about specific stories. I would urge you to get in touch with Kiundu, who is kind of our, our, our leader in, in in Kenya and East Africa, uh, who can help out with specific issues. For instance, I saw one question but from a journalist who wants to investigate fisheries, illegal fisheries trade in East Africa, which sounds like a very interesting issue and which I agree is not well covered right now. So uh, I wanted to, I, I typed in an answer, but just to mention, we will have biodiversity story grants available later this month. So please look on earthjournalism.net for that opportunity. I think it'll be available in a few weeks. Or again, just get in touch with me or with Kiundu and we can point you to that when it's available. Uh, can't promise we can fund the story because we get a lot of applications, but it does sound interesting and you, you need to come up with a good plan to cover it. Um, I, I want to answer, try and answer one other question. I know we're limited in time, but this question about how do you proceed with a story where no one is willing to give you information you were looking for? And this was raised about the cross-border trade between Kenya and Uganda. And this is really the, the heart of the problem and the thing that we as journalists need to figure out, how do you get that information? And it's hard to give specifics about that, but what I always try and tell journalists is you need to find your ally you need to find the sources who share an interest with you in, in, in getting this information out. So who might that be when it comes to say cross-border trade and illegal wildlife products? Uh, that could be perhaps a customs official who is no longer getting the, the, uh, you know, the levies that they're supposed to be getting from cross-border trade. It could be a wildlife official who is very concerned about the, the poaching that is going on. It could be you know, a fisheries official. It could be, um, or if, if you can't find, a, it could be a police uh, officer. I know police sometimes are implicated in this trade, so that can be tricky. And again, you always need to be careful and put your safety first, but it, you need to look for these allies, for these people who have the information and want to get it out, but maybe they don't, have the right channel yet. Uh, and if you can find them, that is really important. Um, uh, if, if you can't find a government or, or a, a local authority to give you that information, sometimes environmental groups, NGOs, they have information uh, who can, to, that, that can help you with your story. Or sometimes even local communities, you know, who see the trade happening um, and can and can give you information. Although that is always tricky, you need to be uh, mindful of the safety of your sources as well. 
So, I mean, we have limited time to discuss this, but I just, you know, that general uh, piece of advice is just find your ally who wants to get that information out. Uh, thank you so much, James, for that. Uh, we are at the top of the hour, but uh, uh, Carol Richabet of The Standard is asking Fiona, does Oxpec has also accept investigative stories from journalists in East Africa? How can one share information on smuggling routes or routes and data on transnational organized crime? And then I'll be remiss if I don't read this. I've received this question for three times now by Martin Obima, who is telling me, Kyondo, I really wanted Dokari to tell me how I convince my editor to consider environmental stories uh, to politics. Uh, Fiona, uh, if you could answer, and Okari, probably, you know, we end with you. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for that question. I did actually answer it directly. Um, I think what I will do is put it uh, into the, the, the link. I shared with Caroline a link. I'll put that into which where you can reach out um, to Oxpeckers. So let me do that. I'll share it with everybody um, immediately after uh, uh, muting myself now. Thank you. Okari. Sorry, I was busy typing and answering some of the questions uh, on the Q&A as well. Uh, to answer that question is, is simply um working on your pitch uh you're you're coming to me as an editor with a story idea it doesn't really matter what story idea it is um the power is in your pitch so you're pitching the story and as you're pitching the story you are looking at the very basics of journalism you know the what the why the when the how and all that why does it really really matter uh you want to cover what life story what's the story because there is newsroom fatigue when it comes to reporting poaching stories, especially in Kenya, because it happens so frequently that we are getting used to, you know, reading about or watching those kind of stories. So it's thinking creatively, and this is where investigative journalism comes in. You're constantly pushed to be creative um, on working on your pitch and your story angles. So you're coming to the, you're going to the editor. And you're saying, this is my story angle uh, for this particular story, because when you're talking about the environment, it's so broad. And therefore, for the editors in the newsroom, they're, they're constantly you know, thinking about the docket stories or thinking quickly within uh, 60 seconds, what they need to work on. So with the limited amount of time that you have and a very short time, can you throw in a very good creative pitch with a very, very good angle and always think of this, in your story, what's the POD, your point of difference? If another newspaper has done that story, how differently can you do the story? If you've watched the story on TV or another reporter's done the story on TV, what were the missing elements in that story that you can pick out and then creatively now work on your story? And then also it, it, goes, along to, it goes along to say that with your sources, if you go to an editor and you're saying, to the editor, I have a very, very good source on this story. I am interviewing a poacher. You know, that will make me, okay, you're interviewing a poacher, how did you find this poacher? That's your source, fine. So work on your sources, get good, credible sources. Sometimes we miss our steps uh, while working on these stories. And um, throughout your career, you will always uh, come across this, uh, these moments when you think you have a really, really, really good, credible source. And whatever they're giving you is very factual and very truthful. Then later on, you start digging and finding out they also have credibility issues, for example. So those are the challenges that you learn to overcome with time. But work on your pitch, be creative. What's your point of difference? What's your story angle? What's new and fresh about it? Because uh, news as we know it is very transient. So what is fresh today, tomorrow will not be fresh. So what new things are you bringing to your story? Then go to your editor with a pitch and most likely they will take the story. That's, that's what I can say. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis. Um, I, I think uh, this has been very good uh, webinar uh, from the 
probably the text messages that I'm receiving here in my inbox. And what I can add to that story is uh, environmental stories, yes, uh, seem to be boring. But I think uh, from Thomas uh, to Fiona to James and Neo Kari, you've mentioned about putting people you know, uh, the human face in the story that always gets, you know, the editors, you know, interested and also a bit of color, you know, you know, narrative, you know, to those engaging videos that Dennis, you, 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 you do in your stories and also a bit uh, of conflict. I, I think that's why we like, you know, movies so much and even novels because there is a form of conflict that you have to, uh, to wear and see uh, whether it's be resolved. And, and, and I think that comes well in the pitch uh, that we try to also train a lot when we're doing our trainings. Uh, thank you so much. I think I will let it up there and say thank you to all the panelists uh, from Dr. Thomas uh, Richard, uh, Fiona McLeod, uh, James Fan. Uh, thank you so much. And I've asked Benon or Luca uh, to put on his video and ask him to wave. Uh, Benon uh, is our investigative uh, editor. Uh, he'll be helping in the judging the story grants that, that we've just closed. And we'll also be working with all of you one-on-one, uh, -on -one, mentoring you uh, on your stories. Um, Beron is uh, an experienced uh, journalist, uh, investigative journalist based in uh, based uh, in Uganda. And he's also uh, a part-time editor for the, uh, the Glo GIGN, the Global Investigative Journalism Network. Uh, so you, you'll be he hearing a lot uh, from him. And from here in Nairobi, for me, it's thank you so much. Uh, goodbye. Uh, good morning to you, James, and good uh, and good evening uh, to all of us in the other uh, time zones. God bless. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kiandu. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and be sure to look for this recording in a few hours on our website, adjournalism.net. Thanks, Kiandu. Thanks, Kiandu. Goodbye. Bye-bye for Bye. now. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye. Goodbye, everyone.